Lee Stevenson, the Executive Director of Church Planning with Converge. And you all are a part of a phenomenal movement of churches that are making a huge difference here in the United States and across the world. And today it is my privilege to introduce you Pastor Mick Martin. Hey, good morning. Are you glad to be here today? Okay, now everybody kind of warned me that you were the rowdy crowd. Is that true? Yeah. All right, some of you are. Okay, all right, all right. Well, like, uh, like it said, my name is Mick Martin, and uh, I'm the lead pastor at Experience Church in Detroit Lakes. And I am just super thrilled to be here. Thank you for having me. Really, really excited. Um, my family and I um, have only been in Detroit Lakes now for about a year. Uh, the bulk of my ministry has been down in Arizona but uh, Pastor Mark Biolo, part of our sister network of churches, has been a friend of mine for a long time, and he's kind of kept me abreast of what's going on. I met Maddie last year and Jeff last year, and just super guys, and we've got to, hung out, got to hang out a couple times and, and just get to know them and hear what's going on here. But i got to be honest with you that, uh, you know, for years, as Mark kind of told me what was going on up here, I kind of thought you guys were on the, you know, in the frozen tundra kind of thing. And uh, until about a year and a half ago when he called me up and he said, hey, Mick, I got this church in Detroit Lakes and needs a pastor and I want you to come up here. And the truth is, after I, I, I laughed out loud a little bit um, on the phone with him, I, you know, I began to pray and I began to talk to the church. And my wife and I came up for a visit and really just fell in love up here with northern Minnesota. And, and I was tired of the desert anyway. So, um, you know, came up here and... Um, just enjoyed, uh, seriously enjoyed my first winter here this last year, and everybody was looking at me like I was weird and all that kind of stuff, and I get it, but uh, I was tired of the hot and the hotter and all that kind of stuff, so we were, we were up here doing some great ministry in Detroit Lake, so if you're ever driving through, come by and see us on a Sunday if you want, um, but really excited to be here with you guys, because I've been hearing some cool, cool stuff about Epiphany Station and been wanting to get up here. And, and, and see where you guys are at, so just really, really glad. Now, a little bit about something about me today, all right? Just so you know, I tend to be rather animated. I get a little excited, and I kind of need the crowd to do the same. Can you do that for me today? All right, so I need you to loosen up and, you know, feel free to hoot and holler and get excited and cheer and all that kind of stuff because we're going to have some fun. Because today, we're going to talk about the church and, and my one thing to the church that I'm, I'm kind of going around and communicating um, is, is all about the fact that we have been called to something greater, that we have been called to be the hope of the world. So I, I want to start today with a quote, if I could. Um, there's a guy named, a pastor named Bill Hybels. Some of you may be familiar with that name. Others of you may not. But Bill Hybels is kind of one of the founding fathers of the modern contemporary church movement. And uh, he's got a big church in Chicago called Willow Creek. And he wrote this book a number of years ago that I would highly recommend to anybody in the room who's in any kind of leadership role, whether it's in the marketplace or in church or wherever. If you're a leader, you need this book. It's called Courageous Leadership. And uh, it, it's been out a number of years. I read it years ago. And in this book, he said something that when I read it for the first time, it just blew me away. And I, I'm hoping it kind of has the same effect on you. Here's what he says. He says, I believe that the local church is the hope of the world. And, and when I first read that, and it caused me to pause, and it was like this, whoa, moment. And I hope it has the same effect on you. He goes on to say this, I believe to the core of my being that local church leaders have the potential to be the most influential force on planet Earth. If they get it and get on with it, Churches can become the redemptive centers that Jesus intended them to be. Dynamic teaching, creative worship, deep community, effective evangelism, and joyful service will combine to renew the hearts and minds of seekers and believers alike, strengthen families, transform communities, and change the world. And I'm here to tell you guys that you and I, as the church, if you're in the room and you're a Christian, all right, and you've got the whole Jesus thing figured out, and you get the bumper sticker and the whole deal, I get it, that's great, all right? But you and I need to always remember that we have been called to be world changers. 
that we have been called to be the hope of the world, to take the hope of Jesus and give it to others. And we can't ever get tired of that, and we can't ever lose focus of that. That's what we've been called to be. So I want to unpack this and give us a little bit of a foundation, if we, if we will. So if you've got your notes, you can pull those out, take out your Bibles or your smartphones, go to Matthew chapter 16. All right, we're going to start in Matthew 16. In this moment, Jesus is walking with his disciples, and he's talking to them, and he turns to them, and he says, hey, who do people say that I am? And so they kind of pipe up, hey, some people think you're the prophet, some people think you're Elijah, some people think you're, you know, some great teacher. And then Jesus says to them, well, who do you say that I am? And in that moment, with, with tremendous clarity, Peter, the disciple Peter, steps into the moment, and he says, well, you're the Messiah, you're the sent one, you're the holy one, you're, in essence, the man, Jesus. You're the man we've been waiting for, the hope. And Jesus replies now, if you have your Bibles, you can follow along with me. Or um, he says this in Matthew chapter 16, beginning in verse 17. And Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. In other words, Peter, you hit the nail on the head, Peter. You got it right. And this is such a significant truth, Peter. This is such a significant moment, Peter, that this truth did not come from other people, Peter, that this truth that you just revealed came from my Father, that this is a big deal. And I'm going to tell you why, Peter. This truth that you just told me about is going to change the world. Watch this. He says, now I say to you, in verse 18, now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. Jesus says, Peter, what you don't know yet, but I'm revealing now for the first time, is that I'm about to do something, Peter, that is world-changing. That I'm about to build something, Peter, that will turn the world upside down. And Peter, well, you don't know this yet, but you're going to have a part to play in this. But I am going to do something, Jesus said. I'm going to build a world-changing organization called the church. And he said this, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. It will be world-changing, Peter. And you and I have a part to play. And here's how. We fast forward in Jesus' ministry now. He told him that, kind of revealed that to him. He does his ministry, all the things some of us are familiar with in the Bible. But then he gets arrested. And then he gets tried, and he gets crucified. And, and all the disciples run away, and they, I mean, the world is ending. But three days later, he comes out of the grave. He's alive, he's alive, he's alive. And he begins to show up to people. And this group of 500 over here, and this group of his disciples, and he shows up over here. And over the course of 40 days, he shows up, and all of a sudden there's a buzz. And people are going, hey, I saw that guy. He was crucified, and then he was alive, and I saw him, and a dead man walks. And there's this buzz happening. And finally, Jesus shows up for the last time to his disciples. And he's about to leave. And he's about to leave them. And he says, now, guys, I'm going to give you your part to play. You see, remember back then I told you I was going to build something. And it was going to be world changing. But now you have a part to play in this. And he says this in Matthew chapter 28. Many of us are familiar with this. It's called the Great Commission. He says this in Matthew 28, verse 19. He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, Jesus said, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You see, Peter, this is your part. I want you to take everything you've seen. I want you to take everything I've taught you. I want you to take all this thing that, that you saw and you walked with me for all these years. And now I want you to take it to everyone else around you. And I want you to go turn the world upside down, which they did if you read the book of Acts. But Jesus was saying, this is way beyond just the Jews. This is way beyond just Israel. I want you to take it to all the nations and change the world. Now, if I were going to give you somewhat of a, a purpose statement, if you were to say, okay, why do we do church? Why do we come in here every, every week and set up and sit and sing and do these ministries? Why do we build buildings? Why do we do all this kind of stuff? 
Here's what I would tell you. The purpose statement is this, that we are to influence people toward life change. We are to influence people toward life change. And life change for us would be becoming fully devoted followers of Christ. You know, here you talk, you talk about um, loving God and loving people. That's what it's about. That's, that's taken from the great commandment. And the great commission and the great commandment give us our marching orders. That there is a purpose, there is a reason why we do this. And we can't ever forget that you and I are to influence people by loving them, by sharing the gospel with them. We are to influence them toward life change. That's what this is about. That if we're going to be the hope of the world, we have to keep our eyes focused on that. We can't lose sight of that truth. But here's the key, and here's where we're going today. Okay, in case you need to go to sleep, or somebody's texting you, or you've got to leave early, or whatever. Here's, here's the key. That if we're going to be this church that we've been called to be, if we're going to be the hope of the world, if we're going to be world changers, then we have to keep Jesus. Jesus must become our passion and priority. Jesus must become our passion and priority. That is absolutely crucial. So here's where we're going today. If you have your Bibles, you want to get ahead, we're, we're going to go over and look at a story uh, in Luke chapter 7. And we're going to contrast two groups of people. There are two groups of people here um, that have different attitudes and different, different outlooks, okay? And we're going to kind of contrast them. And here's what's going to happen, all right? I think it'll happen naturally. Here's what I want to see happen. That as we begin to describe these two groups in here, everybody in the room, you're going to, at one point or another, you're going to kind of find yourself leaning toward one of the groups or the other in how you feel and how you relate to God, all right? And that's good. But by the end of today, I'm hoping that I help you understand how you can be in one of those groups versus the other. All right, so let's dive into that. Now, on your outline, there are just three points real quick. The first is this, that if you and I are going to be, keep Jesus our passion and priority and be the church we're supposed to be, we've got to walk with Jesus. We've got to walk with Jesus, all right? So in Luke chapter 7, this, here's, here's where we are introduced to these two crowds. Luke chapter 7, beginning in verse 11. Soon afterward, it says, soon afterward, Jesus went with his disciples to the village of Nain. Now, Nain was just a, a little kind of out-of-the-way village. wasn't a big deal or a big city or anything like that. You don't hear a lot about it in the New Testament. But Jesus was going toward this village called Nain. And it says, a large crowd followed him. So here's this crowd that is gathered around Jesus and his disciples. And I want us to think about what, what was that crowd like, all right? And I think the answer to that is you've got to look to see what was happening right before this moment. So if you backtrack a little bit in the storyline, you'll see that there was some stuff happening. Right directly before this, we had a moment where Jesus was walking through and um, this Roman centurion comes and he says, hey, I have a servant that needs to, you know, that's sick and is dying. Can you heal him or will you heal him? Right? And so Jesus agrees, well, I'll, okay, I'll go with you, to which everybody else around is stunned a little bit. Why would you go with this Roman guy? I mean, you know, whatever. But Jesus agrees to go with him. And then the Roman centurion does something stunning. He says, no, 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 Jesus, you don't need to come. He says, Jesus, because I, I am a man of authority, and I understand authority when I see it. You see, Jesus, I've been watching you, and you are definitely a man with authority. Because, Jesus, when you speak, the wind and the waves obey you, Jesus. Jesus, you talk to disease, and disease obeys you, Jesus. I, I, you, you don't need to come with me. I understand you have authority. You see, Jesus, because I, too, am a man of authority. And I have soldiers under me. And when I tell those soldiers to go, they go. And when those, I tell those soldiers to come, they come. And when I tell those soldiers to go do that, they do it. I, I know authority, Jesus. So you don't have to come, Jesus. You just need to speak the word and it will happen. And there's this moment where Jesus pauses. And he turns to the people around him. And he says to them, I have not found faith like this in all of Israel. That's saying something considering he's looking at a Roman centurion. So Jesus says, so be it. I, I speak the word. He's healed. They leave. You fast forward a little bit. Sure enough, the servant is healed the moment Jesus spoke. It's an incredible moment. 
You go back a little bit further, and you find Jesus comes along, this guy with a crippled arm, and, he, and he, the guy comes to Jesus, and Jesus heals his arm and straightens it out, and all of a sudden it's whole and it works, and the crowd around him is going, whoa! And then a little bit further on, you have these lepers come to Jesus, and appendages falling off, and I mean, these people, you didn't get near them, never mind touch them, Jesus goes over, and he heals them, and appendages grow back, and things are reattached, I mean, and they're whole, and these lepers are jumping around and the crowd's going whoa and all of a sudden there's this other moment he come along crippled people that never walked and he lifts them up and their legs are healed and this miraculous kind of thing is happening all around him and so my question to you is how do you think this crowd was feeling as they're following Jesus Ooh, whoo, something's going on here, man. Something's happening in the house. I don't know what's going on, but man, did you see that? Did you see he healed that guy and put his finger back on, and there it was? Did you see him? Did you see him over here? He raised that guy up, and man, it's unbelievable. I don't know who this guy is, but we're going to follow that guy because wherever he goes, something's happening. Come on, baby. Woo! They were excited. Yeah, come on. They were, I mean, there was a sense of joy. There was a sense of anticipation. I mean, come on, this guy. Something happens everywhere he goes. Woo, I'm following that guy. I don't know who he is, but I'm going with that guy. There's anticipation. Now, let me ask you something. You're in here and you're a Christian? When was the last time you came to church with that sense of anticipation? You see, I think... I think Christians ought to get speeding tickets to get to church on Sunday morning. Because it's like, come on, something's happening in the house. i got to get there. we got to get. You know, if you're a police officer, let, let them speed on Sunday morning to get to church. All right? Just let that go. Right? I mean, I mean, come on, Christian. We ought to get excited to be here. But you know what? And, and I know this isn't anybody in this room. All right? So it's nobody at, at this church. It's other churches, not you. Okay, so I'm not talking to you right now. But other churches, they don't, they don't treat church like that, do they? They're content being five minutes late, 10 minutes late, 15 minutes late. No big deal. I mean, we just miss the music. Who cares? I don't like to sing anyways. As long as we get there when the guy's talking, as long as he doesn't talk too long. Right? Right? I mean, come on. Thing is, we don't do that when we go to the movies. We don't do that when we're going to a Broadway show. Why do we do it for church? You see, I think Christians have lost their joy. They've lost their sense of excitement. They, hey, guys, listen to me. Listen. If you're a Christian in the room, you have more to be happy about, to be joyful about than anybody else in the planet. We ought to be excited. We ought to be, woo, I can't wait to get to church. Something's going to happen. I don't know what it is, but something's going on. Yeah. And here, look, if you're in the room and you're not a Christian, okay, and somebody promised you lunch and they dragged you here and you're like, oh, and I just, I just, you know, confirmed all your worst fears about church. And you're like, this guy's crazy. He's yelling and, what, you know, what time is it? I get it, all right? I'm glad you're here, but here's what you need to know. If you ever decide to become a Christian, if you ever decide to take that faith step, you will have more to be happy about and joyful about than anybody else. Right? Come on now. That's what this is about. So this is the crowd that's walking with Jesus. They're just something, you know. Now, they weren't the only crowd. We go on. Look at this. In verse 12, and a funeral procession was coming out as he approached the village gate. And the young man who had died was a widow's only son, and a large crowd from the village was with her. And when the Lord saw her, his heart overflowed with compassion. You see, there's this other crowd over here. Here's this other crowd coming out, and I don't know about you, if you've been to a funeral procession, it's not the most exciting place to be, right? You know. And, and you kind of ask yourself, well, how are they feeling, right? Probably a lot of sadness, probably a lot of weeping, depression kind of thing, a very somber, and rightly so, if you've ever been to a funeral, right? Maybe a little anger, maybe a little frustration. 
I mean, because after all, God, I, I, I prayed for that boy to get well, and he didn't get well. And God, I prayed for that widow who had already lost her husband, and I prayed that she wouldn't lose her only child. And God, you didn't answer. He still died. And God, I'm a little frustrated with that. And I don't understand. And maybe you're facing something. And there's something going on in your world. And there's a broken home, a broken relationship. Something's happening. And you've been praying. And you've been asking God to intervene. But it feels like your prayers are bouncing off the ceiling. And nobody's listening. And you're asking yourself, God, are you there? God, do you care? So when it comes to your interaction with God, there's a little frustration. There's a little disappointment. Right? I don't know where you're at, but here's what I need you to know. That in these moments, what this widow didn't understand or know yet, but she was about to, was that Jesus was walking toward her. Jesus had an appointment with her. Jesus knew her struggle. Jesus knew what was going on and for the rest of the crowd following her. And he was coming toward her. And if you're in here and you're struggling and you're in here and there's a frustration or there's an issue that you've been praying about and you don't know what's going on, I'm here to tell you, Jesus is walking toward you. Not only, we, we gotta, number one, we've got to walk with Jesus. But number two, we need to listen to Jesus. We need to listen. Now, I don't know if you're like me and you probably are a little bit. Listening tends to be one of the hardest things we learn how to do, isn't it? We like to talk a lot, but we don't listen very well. A number of years ago, I was uh, having some, some trouble with my uh, old Craftsman lawnmower. It wasn't cutting very well anymore. It was an old mower. And I decided I was going to take the blades off and either replace them or sharpen them or something. So I pull it in my garage. I, I roll the front wheels up on these ramps kind of thing. So I'm, I'm down on the floor, and I'm reaching under there with this big old socket wrench, and I'm trying to get this thing off, and I can't. It, it's not budging. Well, my son, my son, my oldest son at the time was about 14 or 15. He walks in. He was right at that age where you don't like to listen to them at all. And they don't like to listen to you at all. It's right, right there. And he, he walks in. He's like, Dad, he said, why don't you just take the lawnmower and lift it up like this? And then you can reach the blades. And I was like, that is a dumb idea, son. That's stupid. Don't, we can't do that. Gas will get everywhere. Blah, blah, fall over and hurt people. No, we can't do that. So literally, and I'm not kidding. This isn't just preacher story. Um, I, for the next two hours, two hours, I'm wrenching under this thing, and I'm, I, I, I'm pu- I pulled out a blowtorch. I'm torching the nut. I'm banging on that thing. I'm putting big crowbar things on there, and I, I mean, this thing will not come off. And I'm, I'm not cussing, but I'm close to, I mean, maybe it's in my mind. F- forgive me, Lord. But, I, I mean, I'm just getting all, and after two hours, a thought occurred to me. You know, if I lift that lawnmower up, I could probably reach those blades. So I call my wife and my son out and say, help me lift this thing up. And we do. We rope off the wheels so it won't fall over. And I'm like, wow, look at that. I don't even have to take them off. I can just sharpen them right there. And I pull out my grinder, sharpen them up. I'm like, yes. Now, I'd like to tell you that in a moment of humility, I turned to my son and I said, son, forgive me for not listening. You, you were so right. I didn't do that. I probably said something like, man, what a great idea I had. I I don't know. What I do know is that had I listened to my son, I would have saved myself an awful lot of grief. And we do the same thing, right? We do that with the people around us. And we also do it with God, don't we? We don't like to listen to God sometimes because it seems unreasonable. I mean, God, if you knew my situation, God, are you paying attention? I mean, come on. Did you hear what she said? Did you hear what he said? Do you see what they did to me? How, how can you ask me to do that, God? That's unreasonable. We've got to listen to Jesus. Watch this. Watch this in the story. So now the crowd's converging, and they get close enough now that Jesus can actually speak to her. So you can see the two crowds coming together. They're converging. Jesus makes a beeline for this widow. Watch this. And when the Lord saw her, Verse 13, his heart overflowed with compassion. And he said, don't cry. Don't cry. Now, let me ask you something. This crowd in the funeral, they're close enough now. They hear Jesus say to her, don't cry. How do you think that made them feel? Don't cry. What did he just say? He said, don't cry. What a jerk. 
What, what do you, who does this guy think he is? Get, I mean, come on. Do you even know this poor woman? This is her only child. Her husband died. I mean, come on, dude. Get out of the way. How insensitive can you be? Right? I, and again, I've been a pastor for a long time. I've had my share of funerals. I will tell you, I have not one time ever walked up to the grieving family and said, don't cry. I've never done that. In fact, that's probably the surest way you could, you could to get punched at a funeral is walk up to a grieving family and tell them not to cry, right? I mean, just, it's just insensitive. I mean, how, what is he thinking, right? Let me ask you something. This crowd, how do you think they felt? What did he just say? Oh, did he just tell that widow not to cry? Why do you think he said that? I don't know. Man, something's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen. Man, he just told her not to cry. And the buzz starts going through the crowd. They're like, he's talking to the woman. What's going to happen? I don't know. See, what's the difference? I'll tell you the difference. What Jesus said seems incredibly insensitive and out of touch until you know who said it. You see, this crowd had no idea who he was. This crowd had seen what he could accomplish. Two different perspectives. But here's the kicker. Jesus was saying something to this woman that she had yet to figure out, but that all of us need to know. You see, when Jesus said, don't cry, he was also saying something else. And what he was saying to her and what he's saying to us is, don't cry because I'm bigger than your problem. You see, if you knew who I was, you don't need to cry. Because I'm bigger than your problem. And listen to me. I don't know where you're at today. I don't know what you're facing and what's going on in your world. But, that, but you need to understand that no matter how big that giant, no matter how big that hill, no matter how big that obstacle, no matter how deep that valley, no matter how hard that hardship is you're facing, Jesus is bigger than your problem. There is no problem you're facing that is bigger than he and Jesus' words to this woman are the same words to you and I. Your marriage might be in crisis. Your kids might be falling off a cliff. Your finances might be in the toilet. I don't know. But I'm here to tell you that there is no problem you face that is too big for God to handle. If you will listen. If you will listen. And then last... Not only must we walk with Jesus, not only must we listen to Jesus, but now Jesus is about to blow the doors off because now we have to understand we need to believe in Jesus. Okay, watch this. I mean, Jesus is about to do something. So he says this to the woman. He's setting her up. She doesn't get it yet, but she's about to. And look what happens now. He tells her, don't cry. And then in verse 14, then he walked over to the coffin and he touched it. Now, that's a big deal. I don't have a lot of time to spend on that, but you just didn't do that. You didn't touch coffins. You didn't touch things that other dead people were touching. That was a big no-no, especially if you're a religious leader. You didn't do that. But Jesus was communicating something to this woman and to the crowd following because Jesus just tells her, don't cry. I'm about to show you that I'm bigger than any problem. And to show you that, I'm going to walk over to your biggest problem. And I'm going to put my hand on it. And you're in here and you're facing that kind of a problem. And you're facing something that seems overwhelming. And dare I say, seems impossible. And I'm here to tell you, Jesus is not only walking towards you. He is wanting to put his hand on on your biggest problem because he wants to be the solution. Watch this now. So he walks over. They stop. He touches the coffin. And then, it, this is crazy. Watch this. And the bearer stopped. And he said, young man, I tell you, get up. Get up. Get up. What did he just, I mean, what? You can almost picture this crowd over here going, what did he just say? He just told that dead boy to get up. Do you think he's going to get up? I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. Something's going on. And pandemonium is starting to break out in this crowd. 
And this crowd over here, what do you think they're thinking? Oh, my soul, this guy is a nut job. Get him out of here. He's talking to a dead man. Somebody get the straight jacket. Call the police. Get him out of here. He is crazy. You see, listen. Jesus just spoke to a dead man and asked the impossible. And I'm here to tell you that God will often ask the impossible of you. That God will often come and speak into your world and ask you to do the impossible. And if we're going to be the hope of the world, if we're going to be the world-changing church God has called us to be, Epiphany Station, it's time for you and I to start listening to our Savior, ask of us the impossible, and walk by faith, and move forward in faith, and stop just listing all the reasons why we can't. See, that's what we like to do. God asks of us something remarkable, impossible even, and we want to list all the pros and cons. And God, have you noticed my, my con list is bigger than the pros, so I don't think I can do that. And God says, throw away the list and walk by faith. See, God comes to Epiphany Station, if I can talk to you for a minute, and says this, look, you guys are doing great things. You're building a building, and you've raised all this kind of money, and you're going to do great things, and hundreds coming to Christ. It's awesome! And we can have a great time with that. But guess what? I want you to do it again. And I want you to go plant a church over there. And I want you to plant a campus over there. And I want you to build this over here. And I want you to keep going. And we sit back and we go, oh, God, we've been in this building campaign forever. Can it be done? Can't we just be happy? Let's be happy, happy, happy. You know? And God says it's okay to be happy in in what you've accomplished, but I want you to do more. And we go, God, I can't. And I want you to do more. And we say it's impossible. And God says, I'm the God of the impossible. If you'll believe me for the impossible. And you may be here, and your marriage is gone Something else is, seems impossible to overcome, and I'm here to tell you that God is the God of the impossible. And God comes and says, I want you to forgive. And you say, what? God, I can't. I, I mean, you know, I married Attila the Hun. I, I can't forgive him. What do you mean? God, have you been paying attention to how he's, what he's done? What, ah! God says, I'm the God of the impossible. Everybody pull out your fork. Pull out your fork. I grew up in a single family home, and um, my mom raised me, did a great job. She was a great mom, you know, did all the right things. But one of the things my mom was not very good at was cooking. Uh, She just didn't like to cook, you know. So I ate a lot of boxed macaroni and cheese and hot dogs growing up, okay. It was good. Learned how to put cream and mushroom soup and corn in it and make it a casserole. I know you call it a hot dish up here, but of course it's a hot dish. It's hot. But anyways, you know, but that was kind of cooking, right? Well, I had a friend, though, growing up. Uh, He was the pastor's son, and his mom, she could cook. Ooh, she could cook. She was from the south, so she could really cook. And I used to love to get invited over their house. Sometimes it was even Sunday afternoon after church. So we'd go over there, and she'd make this fried chicken with gravy and mashed potatoes and biscuits with butter and more butter. I mean, it was so much butter you could drink the biscuit. It was just, it was so, oh, it was awesome, right? And she had this tradition at at her home. Maybe some of you grew up like this or do this in your home. I don't know. But she had this tradition where she would clean off the table. Everybody had to stay seated. She would clean off the dishes or whatever. And one of my favorite, favorite things, she would look at everybody at the table and she'd say, hold on to your fork. (laughs) She just, right? Some of you grew up in a home like that, right? You know, because when she said, hold on to your fork, she was saying something. And what she was saying was, hey, 
I got something in the kitchen that is better than anything you've seen so far. And you hold on to that fork, because I'm about to bring it out. And it and I'd sit there, mm, 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 clean my fork off. Mm, mm, mm. Right? It'd be like, mm, it's coming. And she'd bring out this dessert that was mind-boggling. And you're like, ah. And you'd forget all the food you just ate. You'd like, i got to go to the bathroom and hurl or something. I don't know, because i got to make room for this. It was so amazing. Listen, Epiphany, listen. I think God is saying to you, Hold on to your fork. Because I've done some great things here, but you ain't seen nothing yet. If you will only walk with Jesus, listen to Jesus, and believe him for the impossible, you ain't seen nothing yet. Who's with me? Come on, let me see the forks. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for today. God, I ask that we would remember that we ain't seen nothing yet. If we are willing to walk with Jesus, to listen to Jesus, to believe in Jesus for the impossible, we could be the earth-shaking, world-changing church God has called us to be. Help us with that, God. Strengthen us. In Jesus' name, amen.